good morning, everybody. Um, who, who you are, if you are joining from USA, it's good morning. If you are joining from Sri Lanka, other countries, uh, good evening or good afternoon in some situations. So today um, I'm going to talk, uh, uh, talk about an exciting uh, subject, um, which I'm very excited. To, I don't know whether you guys are, but I'm very excited to present here today. Um, Cybersecurity is something um, that I have been very passionate about uh, for the last few weeks, uh, not few weeks, few years, um, mainly because um, I, um, I, I actually live in the U.S. And as you can see, they have a lot of data leaks and, uh, you know, people getting, you know, spammed, uh, people getting various different things uh, to steal their identity, uh, steal their money. Um, I also work with uh, some of the clients who are actually building solutions around it. Um, so I, I'm, I got really interested in cybersecurity about a few years ago. Um, recently, we started Spot.LK, um, and then I saw a connection between cybersecurity and how to prevent cybersecurity, cyber attacks, uh, people you know, lo losing their information, especially from the HR side. And how can we connect that to HR? And how can we have a human firewall? Um, I'm going to explain what human firewall means. Um, again, my name is Jeeva Pereira. Uh, I'm the founder uh, of various different companies. I don't, I don't want to go into all the details, but um, uh, welcome. Uh, we really like to, uh, I really appreciate you guys are joining today. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and start. All right, for the agenda today, um, we are going to discuss what, what is the need for this, uh, this presentation uh, or this webinar? Uh, what led us here? We are going to discuss uh, cybersecurity terms, principles, and brief history. Uh, very brief, guys. I'm not a cybersecurity expert, but running, talking to customers, running a company, I have come across various different things that I found is helpful. At least some of the tips that I found is helpful to prevent um, cyber attacks. Um, and this is going to be a little bit of technical. And also um, I will try to relate how HR can intervene and help uh, the IT teams and all the other teams for that matter in the company uh, to help uh, cyber attacks in the future. Uh, I'm going to go over common uh, type of cyber attacks. Uh, then finally, uh, HR role in cybersecurity and how do you recover from an incident? See if there's any questions, no questions. So, so what led us here? Um, okay, so th this is strange, I was working on this this uh, presentation uh, three days ago, then I got a message saying, hey, Facebook was able to <laughs> lose 533 million user accounts in 106 countries. That's massive. That's the most I have ever seen somebody lose personal information. Um, I'm not sure about other countries, but if you, if you lose your personal information, like a phone number, uh, your birth date, and your address information, um, you can easily get a credit card for it. People wouldn't even validate you. Um, you can easily sign up and get a credit card. So for Facebook to mine our data, because that's, that's where they make most of the money, right? And also to lose our data, um, that's very questionable. Uh, and I'm pretty sure people don't know much of this right now because it just happened uh, about three days ago and um, I, I'm sure they will have you know, a hard time defending this. Um, those of who are interested to see whether your information was <laughs> downloaded or hacked, uh, you can go, to, I will post this on somewhere. The team will post this uh, slide deck. Um, you can actually click on this link and go and see whether you can put, this is not a scam guys, this is not a clickbait. Uh, we are not trying to scam you guys. Um, you know, typically, I wouldn't recommend anybody clicking on a link, but you could absolutely click on this link, put your phone number and see whether your information was leaked. 
All right. Um, so a couple of other things. Um, Equifax in the USA is a credit bureau and they managed to you know, leak 147.9 million uh, records uh, of all Americans and 15.2 million British citizen uh, private data. Uh, the problem with Equifax is that they have more information that, than Facebook. They have our credit history and everything. So if you look at this chart here, um, they lost 147 million names, 147 million date of birth, social security numbers, 146, that's a, that's a huge deal, right? Address information, you don't need all this much information to get a credit card, but having social security number, even better, you can easily get a credit card. So what people do is, oh, bad people, uh, they go download this information from somewhere like a torrent site uh, and they go and apply for um, credit cards. And I, was, uh, I will also tell, um, there's a slide here that I'm going to go over how to prevent this. Even if, if you lose the data, how can you prevent this from happening? Uh, not prevent this from happening, sorry. What I meant to say was, how even if you lose the data, um, how can you do things to prevent people from getting a credit card or using your personal data for their benefit? Um, SolarWinds Orient hack, um, this is a strange one. Uh, this happened about, I believe it's about a month ago. It was an ongoing thing, but they only discovered about a month ago. Um, SolarWinds, I don't know how many of you know what this company does. Uh, they build software systems or the security systems for large companies. Um, if you look at down here, US Treasury, Commerce, uh, uh, Energy, Homeland Security, right? So Homeland Security was supposed to protect people, but because of SolarWinds software they are using internally, um, you know, they lost data. So when I say 18,000 customers, that is not humans. Those are companies using this Orion software. And uh, if you want to know more about how exactly this happened, I'm not going to go into this because this is a HR related uh, webinar. But if you do want to know exactly how this happened, um, there's really nice articles as to how they change the software, how hackers change a DLL file or a software inside to go and redeploy the application. And when SolarWinds deployed the application to all these 18,000 customers, um, they got infected. All right, um, any questions so far? Uh, thanks, Harsha. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention this. If you, if, you, if you have a question, the only way to ask that question is to chat with the, uh, just post your question to chat uh, and that should be the host. So let's add, uh, ask the host uh, if they have any questions, if you have any questions. All right, moving on. Oh, that's not what I wanted to show. How did that happen? Okay, let me go back, guys, sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. All right. Um, so this slide actually tells you cost of a data breach. Um, and th this is, I looked at this number and said, I said, I, I definitely need to educate people. Again, I'm not a security expert. I'm not a cybersecurity guy, but I, I really thought with my background and, you know, having an audience to show um, the exact cost of a data breach, I thought this is, this, this will be useful for everybody. Uh, people, I know that you know, whoever's in this uh, meeting. Um, I see some of, uh, you know, our employees also join in here. Um, if you are HR, if you, are, if you have been saying, I don't have to worry about data breaches, I don't have to have a policy, um, I do not need to think about this, uh, at least this slide will change your mind. Uh, I know some of the companies in Sri Lanka does healthcare work for other countries, especially um, US and, and European countries, and they are governed by very strict laws. And you like it or not, um, you will be responsible. If you have a BA, uh, 
you will be responsible ultimately uh, for the data breaches if, if that were to happen. So it is a big deal, right? So, so 2020 data breach, it's the uh, 3.8 uh, 3 million. Uh, and healthcare is the highest. And that's the average cost. And here's the healthcare cost. Um, PII uh, stands for personally identifiable uh, information, meaning that your first name, last name, middle name, um, address information, your social security number, uh, age, not the age, but the gender, um, date of birth, those are the personal identifiable information. This, um, this information, um, it, it's, it, whenever somebody releases it or hacks it or uh, get breached, uh, it costs $150 per person. That doesn't mean that that's all you had to worry about. Uh, think about Facebook, how much Facebook is going to face, right? So take 500 million people uh, and multiply by 150, so you will have a good number what they're looking at, right? But that's, that's again, I think this is the average as well. Um, yeah, United States obviously has the highest number. This is a scary number as well. Uh, on average, companies take about 190, 97 days to identify and 69 days to contain a breach according to IBM. Uh, in, and this time, um, they are breaching, right? They, they are breached and they are downloading. Um, all right, um, top 10 biggest data breaches of all time. And that, this may not be true because uh, because of what happened with uh, Facebook. Once I put this presentation, I came to know that Facebook re were able to release 500 million, right? So Facebook will come at the top, but he has all the companies who release data, right? Accidentally or hacks or, you know, basically just ignoring security protocols. All right. Um, Quickly, I'm going to go over this. Uh, this is a little boring, guys. Um, honestly, uh, I really didn't enjoy putting this together, but I, I thought some of the, I love the terms. I uh, don't really care about the principles, uh, principle, but I do love the uh, little bit of history. Um, and I'm going to show you different ways to, these principles are just a lot of words, right? It basically means that how can you safeguard your company? How can, as a HR department or IT department, how can you safeguard the company, right? I'll go through that and give you a couple of different examples of that. Um, so what is cybersecurity? So according to Wikipedia, is the protection of computer systems and network from information disclosure, theft or damage to their hardware, software or electronic data, as well as from disruption or uh, misdirection of the services they provide, right? So basically, how can you safeguard your systems uh, from various different threats that we face today? Uh, bit of history. Um, so how how does um, the hacking started, right? How did all of this get started? Uh, in 19, 1971, uh, this where I, when I was born, born actually, um, uh, DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation, um, had a mainframe computer working on a 10x operating system. I don't know what 10x is, but somebody was able to, I cannot remember the guy who did this, um, he actually created a, uh, a message, a, a message that goes across the screen, say, I'm the creeper, uh, catch, catch me if you can. Um, so they call it a worm. Uh, and this, is, this actually predates the, the internet as we know it. So internet started with the ARPANET. Um, if you guys are you know, history buffs uh, on, on security and internet, you would know what ARPANET is. Uh, but if you don't go and look at it, how, how the internet started, it's a fascinating story. So this is how, this is how it looked like on the screen, right? Olden days, you know, green, green font, black background. So this is the first recorded, um, a, a first hack to a system. Um, there's a long history of, you know, what regulations were put in, put together uh, to prevent this. Uh, I didn't put everything in here, but uh, some notable ones is uh, in September of 1983, the first cybersecurity patent was granted. Uh, 
1986, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, CFAA, was enacted to address hacking. Um, hacking, as you know, is, is illegal. Um, terms. So th this is the part I really like for you guys to understand, uh, or at least briefly understand what this is, because more and more and more when we go to, like people are working from home uh, because of COVID, um, and you are going to find out that you don't have the same security levels you had when you work at the office, and you, more and more you all are going to hear if you have anybody here on the on the on the meeting uh, from HR, you are going to hear that um, there will be different terms that you are going to encounter because your IT is going to come to you and say, "Hey, this happened or that happened." Uh, so I, I thought it would be prudent for me to put some terms in here so you know exactly what that is. So when people talk about attack vector, no attack surface, what it means is that all the software-based system. Um, brute force attack. If, if your IT comes and say, hey, they are running a brute force attack, what it means is that your username and password or everybody else's username and password or somebody's username and password is being, being uh, attempted multiple different times. Um, so a brute force attack can happen to your, uh, to your systems. Let's see how you have a web application, has a username and password. Um, then somebody's trying to create a script from outside, trying to hit that username and password million times uh, with dictionary and all that. So I'm going to go a little more, more details into what the brute, brute force attack is and how it is uh, accomplished. Uh, but suffice to know for this, uh, that it is you are generating random username and password, or you are using a dictionary to attack your website, uh, your email system, your network system to get in. Um, crypto worm. Uh, so this is basically a form of malware, uh, meaning that you click on a link, you, somebody send you an email, you click on that email, uh, it automatically installs something on your machine, and it encrypts your data. Uh, we also, uh, there's another name for this, which I'm going to go over that. But um, this is a very dangerous situation. Uh, and I know a couple of different people in the US, I personally know them, uh, they got locked out of their machines because of this. Uh, malware. Um, so uh, it's, this is a software that propagates via an email attachment or link to a malicious website. Um, I'm going to go more on that, but basically um, malware is that again, you can have a link, you can have a text message saying that somebody's in the hospital, you need to click here, or you have to pay them, you click on it. That's the end of the story, right? Um, they install something on your machine, on your phone. Um, uh, phishing and spear phishing attacks. Uh, this basically tricks users to surrender their user credentials. Um, and again, I'm going to go over this more. Ransomware. Um, this is a class of malicious software that prevents the end user from accessing a system or data. Um, so basically what happens is that um, before ransomware, there were ransoms. People will come, uh, wealthy families, uh, you know, bad people will come, they steal their dog or they steal their you know, loved ones, uh, your child, your husband, and they will take them and say, hey, I want a you know, million dollars or hundred thousand dollars, so I will release it. So now it is on software. So that's what ransomware is. You, uh, you click on something, click on a link, somebody sends a really nice you know, JPEG, you click on the JPEG and all of a sudden your computer is locked and you cannot access your data. And the message will say on the screen, hey, pay me uh, to this account, send me 10 Bitcoins or one Bitcoin or half a Bitcoin, um, then I will unlock your computer, right? Um, I'm not only pointing this to you all, uh, I'm also going to show you how to prevent this thing. There are things that we can do to prevent this, right? Um, denial of service. Um, so basically what this is, is um, it's a, again, it's cyber attack, but it, it, it's flooding your machines or a network or your website with traffic. Uh, think about, you know, you have a road, you have, you know, 10 cars go in a second, you are trying to send million cars on that street. So it's going to get congested. So denial of services, such as uh, attack where 
you uh, consistently with multiple different machines, you are hitting one website, uh, either trying to log in or create high traffic. So the legitimate users who want to get into that website or who want to use the network cannot get to that system anymore. So that's what a denial of service attack is. Um, social engineering, social engineering um, it's basically a psychological manipulation of people into performing actions, so divulging confidential information. Um, so basically, um, I, I have really good examples on social engineering, so I'll, I'll explain this a little more. Um, but basically, you know, they are trying to get your username, password, personal information so they can use that for malicious uh, intents. Um, zero day exploit. Um, zero day exploit is um, is a exploit or a attack where hackers look at a software and say, "Hey, the software was released today, and there are weaknesses in there, and I'm going to exploit them." Uh, not really relevant, but uh, if you look at the solar wind attack, uh, very close to a zero day exploit because their new software had a problem, and when they did, when they released it, all of a sudden the people who knew this uh, started attacking their system. Um, any questions so far? No questions. Okay, perfect. Um, all right. So security principles. So an effective cybersecurity program, um, and this is a little important, pay attention to this. Uh, an effective cybersecurity program must adhere to set of sound security principles. Um, there are a lot of things to discuss here, guys, but you know, the bottom line is, do you have a uh, program? You know, it could be a one page document saying here, when this happens, this is what we are going to do, right? Um, Implementation of each organization will vary, obviously, because we we are in we are in various different organizations. There's various different things, but the healthcare is not the same as transportation, right? Services are not going to be uh, the same as software industry, uh, but the basic principle remain consistent. Um, I know when people talk about cybersecurity, it, it's overwhelming to look at all these things, but I have some links here which will be if you want to implement something like this in your organization, uh, probably you can use. Uh, while each individual principle may be uh, articulated differently for any given organization, a govern, uh, governing cybersecurity policy should include a close variant of the following four concepts. So these are the concepts you need to pay attention to, right? Uh, identifying and managing security risk. Um, Small organizations do not have chief information officers or chief information security officers, but somebody has to be responsible. This could be the, the IT person in your company who's responsible for it, this, right? Um, document conf uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability of systems and applications. So do you have documentation as to what your system looks like? You have network diagrams. Do you have, you know, who has access to what, right? So that's what we need to document. Again, typically this is like a three, three, four page document if you don't want to go overboard with all the information that we need to. Larger companies, uh, publicly traded companies, they, have, they are governed by large security systems or large uh, bodies that they need to adhere to. But for smaller companies, um, you don't need to do most of this. But you do need to understand where your systems are, how the network is laid out, who has access to what, those kind of things, right? Uh, security risk management process are embedded into risk management framework applicable to the organization and its mission. So large organizations have security management frameworks or the risk management frameworks and also security management frameworks such as NIST framework, which is a, a, uh, it, it's a it's organization in the US that large companies need to adhere to uh, so they can go hand in hand with the security as well as the risk management. Uh, because obviously, you know, having a security uh, breach is a risk, right? Um, for people who do not have a framework, you can say, hey, what's our highest risk if we were to lose this server or if somebody were to steal the data, right? So that's easy to document, right? Um, before any applications are authorized for use uh, and throughout their operational life, uh, their uh, security risk has to be identified, documented, managed and accepted. 
So people, so, people release software to the internet uh, without actually paying any attention to security. Um, I have done it. I learned my lesson. Um, but my recommendation and most of the cybersecurity recommendations are that do a penetration testing on your application locally. Um, and as experts, if you don't have expertise, at least ask somebody, a friend who understands security a little bit, ask, look at the code and say, hey, are, are, we, are we doing this the right way? Are there, are there any uh, vulnerabilities in the code, right? Um, so th this is an important point. And you need to do this not after releasing it because of the zero day you know, attacks, uh, and believe me, there are people, and, and this surprises me that this very smart people who sits in a corner in, in, their, in their basement and their whole uh, objective in life is to hack other systems, right? And they have tools to say, hey, there's a new website online. Let me go and look at the problems and I'm going to attack that website. So this is an important step. Um, ultimately, you know, what we are trying to prevent is a huge lawsuit, right? Um, implementing security controls to reduce security risk. So obviously, you know, if you have a network, uh, you control the network, uh, you know, you need to look at the security risks and how to mitigate them. Um, all right. Um, so security, uh, security principles, implementing security controls to reduce security risks. Um, so systems and applications must be uh, delivered and, um, and supported by trusted suppliers. So this is something in all of our companies that we use internally. Uh, we do not buy anything from untrusted suppliers. We used to, we don't anymore uh, because we trust them to supply us with the right, uh, right uh, hardware, not something hidden inside where application running in the background stealing your information, right? Uh, able to audit systems and applications. Uh, we need to be able to audit your systems and applications. So if you are a large company or a medium-sized company, you have you know, 150 you know, machines, you need to be able to audit them. Uh, able to mitigate uh, vulnerabilities promptly, meaning that if something happens, somebody calls and say, hey, my computer is not booting, you need to be able to mitigate that. If your network is down, you need to be able to mitigate that. This is why having a little policy or a document saying, He's the person responsible for this task is important because remember, it, it will happen the worst possible time. You will be sleeping two o'clock in the morning. Somebody will call and say, hey, our system is down. So if you don't have a policy, if you don't have a phone number to call, you are in trouble, right? Um, don't ever use pirate software or the operating systems. Um, I'm going to show a chart. I think 80% of all the pirated software that you uh, download freely have spyware installed in there. So it, it looks like a legitimate software. You install it, it runs, the operating system runs, but in the background, it's stealing your information and sending that to uh, somebody in the, the middle or in Russia or in China. Um, always use end-to-end -end encryption, meaning that use a, uh, H -H uh, HTTPS. Um, backup, have a backup plan. Because if something drastically goes wrong, this is your only solution. Uh, only trusted and approved personal are granted access, meaning that don't give everybody, don't let people share passwords. Uh, and also don't give everybody access to the systems that you don't trust. Um, th this also includes third parties, right? You have this IT guy who comes to the system and IT guys goes on vacation and he says, hey, I'm going to transfer my username and password to IT guy number two, and he's going to help you guys while I'm on vacation, um, you know, have a documentation, get their phone numbers, uh, do a little bit of background as who this guy is. And grant minimum access. Don't give them more access than it's necessary. Um, this is one of my favorites. Use multi-factor authentication. Uh, multi-factor authentication is basically you log in and you log into your website, it either text message you or email you, it'll, it'll ask you to put a code. Uh, that way you know that it is you who's resetting or the system, not who, it's you who's resetting, not somebody else, right? Um, so this is also one of my favorites. Uh, personal are provided with ongoing cybersecurity awareness training. Uh, this is important because the cyber, cybersecurity landscape changes like every every month, 
uh, new attacks are being discovered. So ongoing cybersecurity awareness is very important for a company. Uh, so security principles, detecting and understanding cybersecurity events. Security events and anomaly, uh, anomalous activities must be detected and uh, analyzed promptly. Tools and applications used to achieve these policies include firewalls. So you, if you have a firewall, make sure that you can audit the firewall. How can you audit the firewall? The only way to audit the firewall is guys, instead of spending too much time, when you set up the firewall the first time, make sure that firewall, all the firewall rules are downloaded somewhere. So you have a copy of the firewall if something goes wrong. Many of, uh, many of you may not know what a firewall is, but it's basically a, a, a device uh, that prevents people coming into your system, uh, unauthorized people from coming into your system. So make sure that you have a blueprint of your firewall downloaded somewhere in case something happens. And you can compare that blueprint with the new firewalls because hackers get into firewalls and they change the rules. Um, there are systems that you can use called intrusion prevention systems, uh, uh, which will actively prevent any intrusions to your systems or to your network. Uh, endpoint detection and response uh, systems, EDRs, is a cyber technology that uh, continually monitors and responds to mitigate cyber threats. Uh, these, these systems are very advanced. Um, they can find out that from one IP address, like if from Russia or from China, that's where most of the hacking happens right nowadays. Um, when they see this IP address, the public IP address that is coming from Russia, it will automatically shut them down. Then you are uh, proactively, this, will, this is a proactive system. Uh, what you would do is very reactive where you find out somebody's coming into your system and you are going to stop them from coming. This will uh, proactively stop them from coming into your system. Um, all right, uh, responding to and recovering from a cybersecurity incident. Um, in today's business environment, the likelihood of cyber attacks is relatively high. I would say very high. Uh, being prepared, respond and recover is paramount. Policies around this capability should include. So uh, in this call, in this, in this meeting, we have people from Sri Lanka. They are like, why do I have to worry about cyber attacks? I'm in Sri Lanka. I don't think Sri Lanka is a cyber attack, Victor. Um, you are absolutely are because at least us, you know, our company in Sri Lanka, uh, Champ IT Solutions, so Champ Soft in Sri Lanka, uh, we work with customers. Uh, they have highly sensitive data, even though we don't store anything in Sri Lanka. Uh, we, we are a, a great attack vector, right? Because it, they cannot go to large companies and go behind them because they have a lot of money. Large companies have a lot of good security systems, so they cannot get into it. They will go to people who deal with data. In most cases, they are India or Sri Lanka or some other country, right? So that's why, you know, don't, don't ignore um, cybersecurity. It is it's just a matter of when. So if there's an incident, it must be reported both internally and externally. It's one of the difficult things to do, but you need to do this. Um, in USA, uh, we are under HIPAA, high tech and CCPA guidelines. Um, so if there's an incident, you have to let somebody know about this. A government entity uh, need to know about this. And that's by law. In Europe, uh, there's general data protection regulation. Um, and you need to, so if you are a company who's doing uh, work for a European company or a US company, you are governed by that, right? In Sri Lanka, unfortunately, we don't have a data privacy legislation, uh, but there are a couple of different things. I hadn't gone into any of these guys, to be honest, but I'm pretty sure there are a few things in, a few articles in here that goes into um, the privacy. So keep that in mind. So you are, even though we don't have a legislation, you are governed by some kind of a legislation in here. Um, immediate uh, containment, eradication and recovery. Uh, what is your business continuity and disaster recovery plan? So do you have a disaster recovery plan? And this could easily be saying, hey, call somebody, right? And he's going to restore our service. So that is your recovery plan. Um, how do you, if you are if you are down for 24 hours, is that is that um, 
is, is that going to uh, impact your uh, work, right? Is that going to impact um, your services uh, or your SLAs? So those are the things that you need to take into consideration. Okay, so common type of cyber attacks, uh, social engineering attacks, phishing, uh, spear phishing, wishing. Yeah, it, it goes on. Um, I'm not sure that you remember this, at least in the US people who are in the US, uh, we had a Nigerian friend sending us email saying, hey, um, if you give me $2,000, I'll give you 50,000 over $1 million, right? So a lot of grandmas and grandpas, they're like, oh, easy way to make money. I'm going to give this nice person my bank information, or I'm going to send them a check, right? And this is a scam, one of the earliest scams I could remember. Yeah, the Nigerian prince is never going to email you back. Um, so IT supports calling to get your personal, uh, your password because there is an emergency. Um, this, is, this is going to happen. <laughs> and this had happened to me a couple of times. Uh, Microsoft calling me to reset my password. It's like, no, I know better, right? So if your IT support calling, if you know the IT guy, you, you know him very well, it's okay to give you this information. But if you don't know the IT guy, the best thing to do is don't even entertain. Right. If there's an emergency, there should be emergency protocol uh, and follow the protocol. This way, having a documentation saying, in case of an emergency, what to do, everybody need to know this in the company. Uh, um, so email from a bank or a credit card company. Again, we're talking about phishing, right? People trying to get your information. You get an email from a bank or a credit card company uh, saying, hey, your, your charges are really high. Um, I need to I need to log into your system to see. Uh, could you please share your username and password? Don't ever give that. Uh, typically, banks and um, credit card companies do not email you. I don't know about Sri Lanka, but in the U.S., it never happens, so they don't text you. Uh, they will put this on their website. Uh, they will send a notification saying, "Hey, you have a notification on your website. Log it, log into it." But they would never tell you you need to reset the password or anything like that. So. When in doubt, call the company, call your bank, call the credit card, card company and say, I got this message. Um, um, is this legitimate, right? Um, email for a retailer saying, hey, you want a trip to you know, Hawaii or to India or Sri Lanka? Um, this is never, a, never the case. People don't give free stuff, at least not anymore. Uh, so if this happened, just ignore it. Uh, whaling, uh, this had happened to a company that I know, and I thought I should probably include this in here. So what, what happened was they had a website and the website, typically most websites in the US, they have all the directors and CEOs, CFOs. Um, so this, what these guys did was they went to the website. So the bad guys went to the website. Uh, they looked at the CEO, typically CEO picture is there. His name is there. They looked at, and also sometimes the email and the phone number is there, which is, I think, a terrible idea to put it in there. Uh, then they they looked at the CFO, and they wrote an email as if the CFO, the CEO, is writing to CFO, and they followed CEO CEO through their his Facebook site. So they they waited until the CEO went on a vacation. And the CEO is stupid enough to put all his information on Facebook. So the guy saw CEO is going on a vacation and he will be gone for six hours on the flight. So during the six hours, they send an email to the CFO, which is the chief financial officer and say, hey, I want you to transfer this much money. I'm on my flight. I want you to transfer this much money uh, into my account, right? Um, and you know, fortunately, she knew better because they, they, they had a plan internally. She called the CEO and said, hey, did you ask me to transfer money? And, they, and, and, and the CEO said, no, I didn't, right? So you get an immediate call from somebody. Uh, again, this is for large companies, right? Small companies, you always call, right? But large companies, whenever this happens, don't transfer it until you call them. Use a different method to do it. Don't email, don't text, call them directly and ask, hey, did you ask me to transfer money, right? So that's called whaling because you're going to get large sums of money. 
um, wishing. Uh, so this is basically a voice phishing. That's what it is. So you get a call from a stranger uh, saying, hey, your son or daughter is in jail or hospital or they're in trouble and I need you to transfer money right now uh, to this account um, and it's thousand dollars or five hundred dollars or whatever that amount is, right? Uh, don't ever do that. Um, if, if they're in jail, call the jail. If they're in hospital, call the hospital, right? This is a um, this is something I have started getting recently. It's, it's called, hey, if you don't log into this account, we are going to uh, cancel your login. It's like, fine, I, I don't want that account anymore. Uh, but yeah, if, if you get it, if you get something like this, don't click on the link. Go to the website, log into that website, and see. And um, I, I guarantee you, they, they don't just lock you out from a system. So how do you prevent this? Um, Continuous use education and exercise, right? So hopefully after this uh, webinar, you know some of the things that's happening uh, and you could you could learn from it. And if you find that you're working for a large company, I, I'll share this. Uh, please share this because I think there are some good information on this in slides, right? Uh, please share this with people. Um, so that, that actually involves education, right? Uh, filter suspicious attachments and URLs. Uh, this one is hard to do, but if you're using uh, like Office 365 emails, um, they are sort of, they filter all this for us, so we don't really have to worry about it. But if you have your own email server, there is no way for us to do this. Uh, but there are software that we can use uh, to do this. Um, disallow weak passwords and enforce uh, recurring password changes. So basically don't put, I'll show you a slide which is funny. Um, the, I think the, uh, the most used password was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> and that has been hacked like multi-million times, million, million times, right? Tens of million times that's been hacked, but people still keep using it. So create a password policy internally that you cannot, you can enforce this, right? If you use Windows or websites, you can enforce this uh, for them to you know, have a very strong password. And this is basically because of brute force attacks. Brute force is like I explained, it's somebody's running a system in the background trying to hit your website or your system million times uh, until they guess the right username and the password. So having a strong password, it will prevent that from happening. Um, I use LastPass, uh, but and it, it is also a uh, free, there's a free LastPass version where you can store all your passwords. So when you go to a site, like if you go to Amazon, automatically LastPass will prompt you for your password and it will remember the password, it will save it. LastPass uses one uh, master password. When you have the one master password, you can store all the other passwords there. So I would use something like LastPass or Dashlane to store your password. It also has the capability to generate a um, very strong password. It will look at the password of the website. Like when you go sign up for, let's say Amazon or Microsoft, it will look at the password, um, the strength, and it will automatically uh, generate one for you, or you can go and generate one for your um, manual if you wanted to. Um, yeah, so don't use your wife's husband or pet's name. Uh, they are easy to find when you have a social media presence, right? So Jerry Brown, I, I'm not really sure who Jerry Brown was, but uh, he puts everything, uh, read this, this is funny. He put everything uh, about himself on Facebook. So people who want to guess your password, your, uh, that's what they do. They create a dictionary. They will call a dictionary called, let's say, Jiva, in this case, Jerry Brown. And Jerry Brown's everything about Jerry Brown is in that uh, in that in that dic dictionary, and they will do a brute force attack, right? So yeah, so if you put um, if, you, if you put your dog's name like Dharma, that's a bad idea, because now we, they know your you know dog name is Dharma. Um, again. How do you prevent most of this from happening is, you know, enable MFA or multi-factor authentication. Uh, basically, multi-factor authentication is that you log into a website, it texts you and say, hey, you're trying to log into the website and here's the code if you do, right? So let's say like in, this, in the case of, you know, people losing your data like the Equifax or, um, or, or Facebook, um, 
even though you use your data, if you have your like if you have your Facebook account two factor authentic or multi factor authenticated, or you have your websites uh, like um, Amazon um, in the logins, if if you had enabled the multi factor authentication, um, they are going to even though you are using MN and password, everything is online. You still have another gauntlet to get into, right? It, there's another prevention method. So that's why enable, if you have any, any um, publicly available website, if they have multi-factor authentication, enable that because that can prevent 99% of the social attacks. Um, you know, obviously you need to scan for malware and viruses. Uh, long time ago, this, this, this uh, used to be very costly, but uh, Windows comes with a very, very good, uh, I highly recommend installing Windows Defender. You don't need any extra malware or viruses. You don't have to pay. Use Windows Defender. I personally use Windows Defender. Uh, it, it's free. It comes with your Windows 10 installation. Um, common type of cyber attacks. Um, so ransomware. So once executed, it can lock your computer systems. Uh, computer or encrypt uh, your files until a payment is made. Uh, could steal your identity and wreak havoc, right? So basically you get an email, like I described before, you get an email, uh, you get a text message, there's a link on it. It's very tempting to click on that link because it, it, it will come from your mother, your father, or somebody that you know close, right? And you wouldn't pay a lot of attention to it. You're working on something, click on it, that's the end of it. They can lock this, right? Then a message would come um, something like this, and it'll tell you, hey, I logged this, I logged your computer, uh, and say, hey, pay me, in this case, this, pay me $150 in 24 hours, or oh, Bitcoins, oh, it says Bitcoins, you stay in Bitcoins, and I will unlock your machine, right? And this is a horrible situation. So if this were to happen, what do you do? You either pay them, right? And they will give you how to pay. They will give you the Bitcoin address. You pay them, or what you do is you you reformat your hard drive, and if you have a backup, that's why backups are important. If you have a backup, you can restore it, so you you you'll be okay, right? And never click on that email or text again. Um, so this is something I personally tried, and everybody fell for this. I put a really nice USB drive, and there was an application running in there. It had nothing but a one application. You clicked on it. It basically sends the computer information to me. Uh, so most of the penetration testing uh, companies in the US, they use this trick. They take a USB drive, go to a company, just leave it randomly on common areas, like in the bathroom or the front desk. And people walk in by and say, hey, very expensive USB drive. I'm going to take this. Nobody's on it. I'm going to take this. They plug that into their computer. As, I mean, what we did was very low tech, but people who, you know, do this for a living, as soon as you put the USB drive, it's infecting your system. So whenever you see a USB drive on the street, on the road, just don't put it on your machine. Um, yeah, email or text with a link. We discussed this a couple of times. Yeah, don't click on a link if you don't trust the link, right? Uh, visiting malicious or compromised websites. Uh, if you type, if you go to Google, um, you will find that there are enough uh, websites that's blacklisted by uh, Google and 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 the and the internet. Um, those, the, if you if you uh, if you visit those, uh, you will be in trouble. So please make sure that. You know, when your browser says that it is an untrusted website, don't ever click on it. Um, torrent sites. I, I used to love torrent sites when, uh, when I was young, but uh, the the problem with torrent sites is that 99% of the applications on torrent sites um, are infected with various malware, uh, viruses that you wouldn't even know that is infected and it's constantly, you know, sending information to somebody else, whatever you do. So it, it's easy for you to, it, it's easy for this to uh, sit in the back, background and steal your username, passwords, your bank account information. So if you are conscious about security and your company actually pay for the software, 
uh, that way you don't have you don't instead of paying five hundred dollars you would not end up paying you know hundred thousand dollars so use uh, use uh, genuine software don't use pirated um, and, and this also includes you know downloading AVI files like um, I, I'm, I'm, I can prove that if you download a movie from a torrent site if you download a uh, um, you know Game of Thrones from torrent sites it has a malware. Malware is on AVI files. It, it, it's, it's embedded in there. Uh, and when you watch the movie, it is actually stealing your information. So be, please be careful when you do this. Um, HR, human resources, you can get a job application saying, hey, um, this is a genuine job application. But when you click on it, pay more attention to is that a JPEG? Is that a PDF? It's a Word document. Uh, and make sure that you know, if it if it looks suspicious, not to open this. Okay, prevention. Uh, don't use unknown, untrusted USB drives. Obviously, um, even if it is free, if it is you know looks really expensive, don't use it. it it's too much of a risk. Uh, don't click email text links. Uh, if in doubt, call the sender. Don't email or text. Right. So, if you if you get an email from your dad saying, "Hey, I found this meme today," uh, and it looks suspicious call your dad or call your mom and say, hey, did you mean to send this to me, right? Don't click on it. Don't click, then call. <laughs> call first, then click. Um, so don't visit sites that are blacklisted. Search the site on Google before visiting, right? Um, if, you, if you find the site name, um, you can also go to Google and say, and Google will tell you whether they are blacklisted or not. Um, I typically look at when emails come from somebody uh, for strange sender addresses, like, uh, and also when you click, you can hover over it. It will tell you where to hover. Google.com is okay because we know it's a registered domain name. It's verifiable, but www.google.abc.com means that ABC company created a subdomain called Google and they want you to click on it to steal your information. So don't click on that. Uh, yeah, never ever visit torrent sites. Don't install pirate software. Like I said, pirate software, 99% of the time, they are, they are giving it free to you because they want to steal information. So it's not really free. You are paying different ways. Um, consumers cost from infected pirate software. Um, this, is, uh, this is 2014, but this had gone uh, very, very uh, um, high. So if you look at, you know, Asia specific, they have the highest rate of pirate, but they have the highest level of um, um, getting systems infected as well. So be careful. Um, pirate software sources and their risks. Uh, so pirate software downloads, um, not going into a whole lot of details, but suffice to say, guys, don't download pirate software. Not only software, don't download anything, even a document, a uh, Word document, like a research paper as a PDF. All right, uh, th these are one of my very interesting parts, uh, malware. Basically, once you're infected with the malware, it looks like this, you know, somebody is fixing it, malware is infecting it. It's very hard to get rid of malware. Sometimes you had to go and, you know, completely wipe out your computer. Um, yeah, obviously malicious software that propagates via an email attachment or link. Um, so if you are infected with a malware, sophisticated malware software not only infect your machine, they also go to your emails, your email address book, to your network, your chats, your USB, your VPN, and try to replicate itself. So once infected, it's going to infect all the other computers that you deal with. You are chatting with somebody, and all of a sudden that their computer is infected and they don't even know it was infected, right? So if you have a malware software uh, or a virus software, there may be a chance that it can detect, but if the malware software is very, very new, uh, which happens every day, right? There's malware every single day. Um, it will be too late for you to do. So all of a sudden that you connect through VPN to a main system, corporate system or to your company system, 
then all of a sudden you have a problem. The whole system is infected because you just downloaded something, right? Yeah, again, USB in common areas, bad idea. Clicking on you know, email text with a link, bad idea. Visiting malicious or compromised website, bad idea. Don't ever go to torrent sites. Uh, man in the middle attack. So what is a man in the middle attack? Uh, so bad guys position in the middle of a conversation between a user and an application. So you connect to your corporate website. Uh, and obviously there's a way to prevent this, but um, if you don't know what's a man in the middle attack is, um, you wouldn't even know this is happening. So Jiva as a user logs into our corporate website, I'm chatting and I don't have a, um, I don't have encryption between two systems, uh, my computer and the server. And somebody who has a software, um, there are various softwares, free softwares that you can download. And they could basically eavesdrop on the communication. So if you do not have encryption channel between two points, the server and the client, when you chat or when you send communication, authentication, any communication with the server, that is basically open uh, to the public. Meaning that if you know exactly what to look for, if you have the right software, you can see what this person is sending and steal the username and the password. So that's a very low tech way of man in the middle attack. High tech way in the man in the middle attack is not only that he does that, he actually plans something. So any communication to the main corporate website goes through his server. It's called a DNS attack. Um, so he created a DNS server. I don't want to go into a lot of technical details, but that's what it really means. So th this is this is very, very difficult to find um, unless you know exactly what you're doing, but it's very easy to prevent. Um, don't, you know, you can, you can prevent this by, here's a picture of a man in the middle attack. So, you know, here's the communication. Here's you, uh, here's the uh, man in the middle. And he, he, blocks this traffic going directly to the server and goes through him. So he can look at all the traffic going between two servers. Um, rogue access points. Um, when you are in a coffee shop, make sure that coffee shop is not stealing your information. Uh, most of the access points that at least I go into, uh, they are not really secure. Anybody can eavesdrop on access points. So make sure that when you do this, when you go to a coffee shop, make sure you have your own VPN access. Uh, that way that VPN actually encrypts the tunnel between what you do, even though you are going through their access point, make sure you have your personal VPN. There are personal VPNs that you can use. I think there's a free version as well. And, and Google is going to implement a free version of their VPN into Chrome. So everybody will have it. So if you have Chrome, you will have, uh, you will have a VPN. Use that VPN so anybody who's trying to eavesdrop cannot eavesdrop it. Uh, encrypted communication channel, uh, or oh, unencrypted communication channel, um, meaning that you use HTTP, not HTTPS for communication. Uh, HTTPS is very easy to hack. Everything is plain. You can see username and password. So if there's a site has HTTP only, don't even log into that site. Um, sniffing is, um, is what that uh, man in the middle people do, man in the middle attackers do. Uh, they use a software called Wireshark. Um, there's a couple of others guys, but Wireshark is very popular. Uh, it's an old software, can actually tap into the same access point and look at everybody else talking. So I can eavesdrop on somebody's communication. If some of you're texting, you can use Wireshark to stop that and look at what they're texting, right? So be careful when you go to public Wi-Fi. Uh, session hacking, uh, this, this basically what this means is that even though you have a, um, a, a encrypted communication channel between two systems, um, you are still sending tokens uh, between the server and the client to identify it. Not going to go into a lot of technical details here, but suffice to know that even if you are even if you have an encrypted channel between your server and your computer, you can still get the token sniffing. You can still get the token, use that token to undecrypt the token and use that information to log into your website. 
so use strong encryption on access points. So whenever you have access point, and you cannot do this public because you don't control it, but if you have your own access points at home, make sure that you have strong encryption, like WPA203. Um, and obviously, you know, use a VPN connection always. Uh, this is like two-factor authentication. If I recommend, if you take if you take something out of this uh, this webinar, it's two things. E either use a VPN connection, and also use uh, also make sure that you have a good platform uh, in case something happen. How can you revert back like backups, right? Um, common type of security attacks here, denial of service attack. Um, so I, I briefly went, went into what a DOS attack is or denial of service attack is. Uh, basically, ba bad guys are trying to flood your system with a lot of artificial traffic. So how do they do this? They do this with various different ways. They're trying to, <laughs> they're trying to choke your system, right? They're trying to choke your network. Uh, choke your website, choke your database, so that way people who are legitimately want to get into the system is unable to get in, right? Uh, there's another another way of attacking. So denial of service is basically from one system trying to choke your uh, systems, but the, the DDoS, which is the distributed DOS, uh, it attacks at a very large scale. So botnets, um, is is a common way of doing it. So this this actually shows you uh, between January 2019 and March 2020 uh, how many uh, brute force attacks, meaning that the botnet's trying to attack your system to either steal your password or steal your information. So you know, as you can see, they are increasing immensely. And every December, guys, this happens more and more and more because December time people are generous, at least in the U.S. and some other countries. Uh, they don't really care. They want to pay money. Um, they pay for charity and all that. So December, November, December, those are the times that you had to really pay a lot of attention to, you know, who's asking for money? What is this link? Am I need to click on this link? Am I going to send this money to this unknown, you know, person asking for money or charity? So please make sure you don't you pay more attention you know, during December. Um, so, so botnets, a brief explanation, botnet is basically, uh, it's a bunch of software infecting machines. So you go, you get an email, million people get emails, they click on this, like 100,000 clicks on that email, it install a bot on your machine, it does nothing but attacking Microsoft or large systems to steal, your, steal their login credentials, right? So that's what a botnet is. Um, so network targeted DOS, uh, basically, I went through this, it's basically going to choke uh, your bandwidth, right? A lot of packets being sent on that. Application targeted DOS, this is a brute force log into a site. Somebody's trying to log into your site multiple different times, so millions of times, so it goes down. The application goes down be because it cannot keep up with it, right? How do you prevent a denial of service? Um, uh, you, you have monitoring tools internally to traffic, look at traffic, unexpected traffic, right? So again, having a policy up front, uh, taking your firewall and look at, hey, in a typical Monday, how much am I expecting? And all of a sudden you have 10 times traffic coming into your system. That's a problem. Application monitoring. You can monitor your applications and if applications go down or application is getting hit by a lot of login, you know something is wrong. Uh, block traffic from problem countries. Um, this is something we do internally. We have block traffic from China and and uh, and Russia. So I don't even have to worry about traffic coming from here because our uh, monitoring platform or our uh, firewall will not accept any traffic from uh, these countries. Um, create a reverse proxy. Uh, reverse proxy is basically, it's, it's like a bounce at the nightclub. It means if you go to a nightclub, if you make... <laughs> If you trouble somebody, if you you know if you are too noisy or making trouble for other people, bouncer will kick you out, right? Um, it's basically bouncer is trying to control who comes into the club and not, right? So reverse proxy is the same exact way. You have reverse proxy. We know exactly who's coming into the system. Oh, actually, try to prevent unwanted people from coming to the system. Um, 
And you can also use systems like Cloudflare uh, to prevent uh, uh, denial of service attacks. It's a specialized service. Uh, some of them, some of the services are free. Some of them you have to pay for it, but I think it's well worth it. Okay, common type of cyber attacks, brute force and dictionary attack. Um, I do want to talk about this a little bit. So this basically bad guys attempted to decipher username password combination by trial and error, right? So basically they are trying to lock pick, right? This is what they're trying to do with different combinations. Um, here's, the, uh, here's the brute force attacks uh, during COVID. Um, so it's increasingly going high, uh, mainly because they know people are working from home and they don't have the same security that they had while working at the office. Uh, they are lax a little bit, so they know they can steal a lot of information and the password. So they, that's what they're doing, right? Um, how do you prevent a brute force? Um, rate limit. So again, some of them, you, you can do this internally. If you have a system, some of them you can't. You could do a rate limit, meaning that if you host a website, um, after five attempts, you can lock for 15 minutes. That way, you know, people who are attacking it after five attempts, this is going to fail, right? They have to wait for 15 minutes a day. It's not they're going to stop, but it's going to prevent, it's slowing down their systems, right? Um, Capture is like a little image. They ask you to say, hey, uh, do you see, a, how many times do you see a bicycle in this picture, right? So you click on this, that's a capture. So when you have a couple of different failed logins, you can put a capture and say, now I want from extra thing, right? Because brute forces doesn't know what a capture is, right? So it's going to fail. I know some of these are really highly technical guys. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but I, I do need to go over this a little bit. I felt like, so you guys understand um, you know, how to at least uh, prevent this. Uh, prompt to change password every 30 days. Uh, this is a good policy to have. Uh, Windows comes with password policies. If you have your own system, uh, make sure that you enforce password policies. Um, prevent users from creating weak passwords. So if you have, you know, you cannot do this most of the time, but if you have a system that you manage, you can uh, prevent people from putting passwords like one, two, three, four, five, right? Um, and if you are using, uh, if you're using LastPass or Dashlane, it can actually generate a strong password for you. Um, so here's, um, this is the slide that I talked to you about earlier. That's the most commonly used password. One, two, three, four, five, six. And number of users, 2,543,000. Um, time to crack it, less than a second. So somebody can crack this password through brute force attack less than a second. Uh, and time, times this was uh, disclosed, right? Meaning somebody was able to hack into this like 23 million times. The second one, third one, password. Really, your password is a password? <laughs> uh, less than a second, right? So just merely by adding a one, look how much time it, it had to spend to get to that password. This is less than a second. A uh, alphanumeric password took three hours, right? If you had added a special character to this, this would have exponentially grown into a couple of days, right? Because it's so hard to crack a password like that. So make sure your passwords use, use um, like a password generation apps like LastPass um, to generate your passwords. Um, Multi-factor authentication, again, like I said, you can prevent most of your logins or most of your leaks, uh, not prevent, even if it is leaks, you can prevent people from logging into your accounts if you have multi-factor authentication, because it has a, it, it's going to text you. When you text it, it's going to text to, uh, to the, the, the username, no, sorry, not the username, but the email or the, or the, uh, uh, or the phone number that's on their record, not to the person who stole it. Um, so we are to the final, how are we doing on time? Okay, we are coming up on, yeah, I'm a little bit over guys, but I'll go through this quickly. So 
what is the HR role in cybersecurity? Um, I try to outline everything in there, even though it's a little more technical, probably you understood some of this, I hope. And I, I hope that I encourage you all to create a, a, a policy internally and put you know, pros and cons of uh, having a policy, uh, mainly pros, because if something happens, somebody needs to you know, have, somebody needs to know exactly what to do, right? So as you have noticed, um, human error is the, one of the greatest threats to an organization. Um, HR leaders and, uh, engage employees in recruitment, culture, and education to boost awareness adoption of new policies to help IT teams develop a human firewall for the organization. So what I meant by human firewall is, and this is a commonly used term in the US, is basically that you educate people internally, not the systems. You cannot educate systems. You can put to have the right systems, but most of 89% of the hacks happen uh, due to human error in, inside a company. Somebody call and say, hey, somebody's sick, or I need a username and password to log into a system. They give it and they lose everything, right? So educating, the only way to educate is not IT. IT is not part of education. IT can put policies together, but IT need to work with uh, human resources um, to educate the team, right? So this is why I thought even though cybersecurity is not part of HR, HR has a huge role to play in cybersecurity. Um, so prime target for attackers is HR due to the highly sensitive nature of data, right? You guys, at least in the US, they collect social security numbers, date of birth, bank information to pay salaries, your background information, uh, your you know, police records in Sri Lanka, all that is on HR. And if, that, if we were to lose that, that's a huge risk, right? Um, so it's imperative that HR professionals understand broadly how to protect data company-wide, right? Not, not just you, just the whole company-wide, right? Uh, while IT creates policies and procedures, HR can communicate with employees. So this is the important part, right? Uh, they are not two different departments. You, got, you need to work together. Um, candidate screening. Uh, so one of the things that you're going to... Uh, and this happened to, I think it's AMD, it's a, a advanced micro devices. Uh, I think that's what it's called. Uh, they had a guy who stole their chip technology. And I may be wrong guys, it may not be AMD, but one of the largest chip companies lost information and they figured out that it was somebody who actually stole from the company internally. Then they did, they did a background check on this guy going back 10 years, then find out that he was the, so this guy was a Chinese gentleman uh, and he was trained by Chinese government to steal US information, but he lived in the US, he's a US citizen. They hired him, um, it's a huge espionage case, right? So they hired him to steal this information. So he came to the company, worked for 10 years before he stole any information. Right. So candidate screening, um, is that necessary? Absolutely, that's necessary. It's not, just not the police report, right? So can the AI help to screen? Ab absolutely, you can. If you go to spot.lk, we do that. Uh, we try to screen, not police, don't get me wrong, we don't do police we have background checks, on, but we have enough technology to figure out, you know, are you getting the right candidate, right? And the platform, when the, our platform matures, we are going to include all these different things. So not only that we can do uh, candidate screening, we can do a whole bunch of other things uh, with it. Um, skill gap. So do you have the right staff to tackle cybersecurity threats? So if the answer is yes, good for you. If the answer is no, make sure that you have at least a consultant in case something like this happens um, could help. Um, the IT person, unless the IT person knows security is not the right person to this job, um, make sure that this person, whoever this guy is, uh, or this team is, uh, who understands, um, understands cybersecurity. Um, review cybersecurity policy with the IT. Um, this is an important step. Make sure that you put a simple policy is enough. I'm not encouraging large policies that people cannot read. Uh, just put a policy in there and make sure that IT agrees, right? And, and probably IT will put the policy and the HR agrees to it. 
Um, so COVID made us work from home. Are we safe? Um, let's see. You are safe if you do the following, right? Um, enable authorized users to log in through VPN. Don't ever let them log into your website without a VPN. Hard to do, but you need to push them to use VPN. Um, you could prevent people from directly logging into your systems by authorized MAC addresses and public IPs. So if you have Jiva working from home and Jiva want to access a system, Jiva need to provide Jiva's public IP address to the system or to an administrator and the administrator will go to the firewall and say, hey, this is the public IP address I'm going to allow to come to the system. So this will prevent people from logging into your systems, right? Or oh, unauthorized users from logging into your system. Um, is the home access point secure? Everybody's working from home. They may not know how secure the access point is. Um, it is their responsibility to make sure that the access point is secure, use you know, encryption, strong encryption, not weak encryption, have a strong password for your admin account. Um, phishing, spam, fraudulent emails, don't click on this. We went through this. Um, this is especially important when you're working from home, saying that you need to come to the office, click this email, don't do that. Um, create an easy communication channel between employees. So this is especially true when you're in an emergency, uh, you're trying to figure out what's going on, and HR need to be involved in emergencies, even though it never happens. It, I think it needs to have a Slack Teams or an AI chatbot that people can talk to and get information quickly. So having a procedure and you don't know the procedure, something goes down. The biggest problem is how do I get to that information quickly? Um, who do I need to call, right? And brand new employee, network guy came into work yesterday. Today, there's an urgent uh, emergency. He or she has no way to communicate with HR, right? So having an easy communication channel between HR policy um, or HR and maybe policymakers inside the company need to have quick access to this. So having a Slack or a Teams channel to communicate is important. Um, obviously, if you have AI chatbot, you can always ask AI chatbot, hey, where is this policy to fix this? And it will tell you, right? So that, that part is important. Uh, so deactivate account for former employees. Um, when an employee leaves, uh, I don't know how most companies that they don't have a termination procedure, meaning that there's not, they don't have a termination policy. So when an employee leaves, you need to deactivate this account. So HR needs to know somebody, somebody you know, left the company or somebody got fired and immediately let, there should be a policy obviously, but you need to let the IT people know that this happened, right? Um, note about password sharing. Um, I put this in here because sometimes the username and password of the employee is the username and password of the system. So you deactivate the employee, your system get deactivated too, right? So never ever share the employee username and passwords with anybody else and never ever use the um, credentials of an employee in a system. So national and international privacy regulation. So HIPAA cannot discuss patient related issue with staff or coworkers unless it is uh, pertinent, right? So these are, these are a couple of things I thought that would be important, at least in the US, uh, that oh, oh, not, not only in the US, even if you are in Sri Lanka, India, wherever you are, if you are working for a US company, if you are doing services for a US company or a um, European company, um, you do need to know these things, right? So under HIPAA guidelines, you cannot share any, any patient information, what I call a PII, personally identifiable information, like a name, address, age, etc. Uh, you cannot discuss this with a coworker. You can go to a bar and having a beer and you discuss a patient that, hey, I found this patient has, you know, this condition with a name, right? You cannot do that. Um, you cannot email, you cannot text PII to somebody, right? So the, the, these are basically, you know, educational. Uh, you, you need to understand what you're, what you're doing. Um, use only company-owned devices. Um, people use their 
private devices, uh, uh, personal devices for company use, company devices for their personal use, keep them completely separated. Uh, that's a bad idea. Uh, encrypt your hard drive with BitLocker. BitLocker is a free software, uh, comes with your uh, Windows machine. Uh, this is especially important. It looks like it's stupid. Why would I need to lock my hard drive? Uh, I am the only user. You are the only user right now, but what if you lose your machine? Uh, you lost your machine. Somebody stole, came to your home, lost your machine. Now he or she has access to everything in the hard drive, right? So having a BitLocker, uh, they will have access to your machine. They may also guess your username and password, but they will never be able to get your data. I say never loosely because you know if, if you're good, you can also unlock this. It's just a matter of time. But at least you know you're making it difficult for somebody to steal your data. If you are using company devices, um, you need to enable um, find my iPhone or find my device if you're on a Google phone. That way, if you lose it, you know where it is. And also it will allow you to remotely wipe your devices, right? So especially when you're working from home, you have company devices, uh, take these precautions. So, Set auto lock computer application logout after 20 minutes. This is especially important because at least in the US people work from home, they get tired, they may go to a coffee shop, they work, they go to the coffee shop, they go to the counter to get the coffee, leaving the machine there. Uh, it should automatically lock the computer after two minutes or three minutes activity because you may be reviewing a patient information on the computer, you go to the counter to get your coffee, by the time you come back, somebody can take a picture, right? So auto lock, um, and if you're logging into application, I just put 20 minutes. That seems to be the default, but you can make it five minutes if you wanted to. But nonetheless, you need to be able to automatically log the computer applications, log out from the application after predetermined time. Uh, not on open public Wi-Fi. I think I briefly touch on this. Uh, if you're on, on a coffee shop, open public Wi-Fi, there, there, are, there are issues with it. Uh, people can eavesdrop on it. So use a personal VPN like Dashlane or, um, or a Node VPN, not Dashlane, sorry, Node VPN or any other VPN software. Um, prevent using external media. We talked about USB sticks and all that. Um, and also this also includes that you're downloading something from the internet to your machine. So this is the last slide. Um, how do you recover from an incident? Um, so I have been in situation. I have been in this situation where I was hyperventilating. I didn't know what to do, right? Mainly because we didn't have a policy. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to call, right? Um, and in worse situations, somebody can say, hey, you are fired. Uh, you didn't know what to do. You were supposed to do this. Um, I'm going to let you go, right? So don't ever be in this suit two situations because they are not funny. They're not fun to be on. Um, so first thing is take a deep breath, you know, drink glass of water, calm yourself down. Um, determine what was lost, right? This is important. So if you have proper documentation that you did, um, you know exactly what was lost. I put spider charts here. Um, basically, if you if you see crime drama on TV, they have this you know this spider chart going around and try to connect each other. Um, that's what exactly need to happen, uh, because most issues, most the leaks uh, nowadays, it's an inside job. So you need to figure out who this person was. Do background check. Did you have the right people, right candidates to that job, right? So. Uh, you know, screening up front for the right candidate is important in this situation, right? So you will never get into a, something like this. Um, yes, like I said, if you have a backup, it will absolutely help you. So if you have servers, make sure you take a server backup. So if you have a local machine, make sure you're taking local machine backup because you never know when you're going to get infected. It's just a matter of time, regardless of how how careful you are. Um, scan for viruses, malware, ransomware, um, change passwords often, guys. Uh, I'm using LastPass. LastPass will remind me every 30 days to change all my passwords. The beauty of LastPass is that when I say, yes, change my password, it will generate a password. It will apply. 
and also it will remember that so I don't have to write my password down. Uh, don't reuse passwords. Um, so if you are under HIPAA, high tech CCPA, GDPR, uh, meaning that you are a company supporting a company in Europe, uh, in Europe or in the US, I don't know about Canada, but you are under a reporting guidelines. So if there's a breach, you need to know, and you will, ultimately you will be responsible as well, unfortunately. Even though it's like, hey, this happened in Sri Lanka, India, or, or Pakistan, um, ultimately you are responsible for it. Some, there is some part that you will be responsible. So make sure that, you know, use guidelines, security, cybersecurity guidelines. Um, in some situations, you may have to inform customers directly. And, you know, obviously you're getting sued, right? <laughs> some, Somebody is going to sue you. Um, it, at least this is in the US. Uh, whenever my data is leaked, uh, at least they give me credit and fraud monitoring, uh, like LifeLock. So they will give me two years of fraud monitoring. So when somebody is trying to use my information to buy a house or buy a car or uh, buy a credit card, um, it will tell, it will send me a message and say, "Hey, somebody's trying to use your information to uh, get a credit card or buy a house, right?" So that that's that's valuable. I don't know something like this exists in Sri Lanka or India. Um, I put this in here uh, mainly for your reference. I'm not going to go into this, guys. Um, here are the cyber uh, framework um, uh, security frameworks that if you really want to, if you really want to implement something like this, uh, some of these are free like HIPAA is free, GDPR is free, FISMA is free. Uh, NIST is not free, but the security framework, they have really good documents saying, hey, these are the things you need to do in your system uh, if you want to be NIST compatible. Uh, and you can basically download this ISO same way. Um, here are some very useful links. Um, I go to at least one of these uh, to see what is the latest on cyber attacks. So they keep updating every day, maybe sometimes uh, twice a day. So read those uh, if you are cybersecurity conscious. Um, I put this here, seven tips to help prevent your employee information from being hacked. Uh, most of this, uh, I copied from this site and put it on this slide. So if you understood something from this slide, you know what not to do. Um, here's a cybersecurity guide. Um, this, this guide has a lot of good information about um, cybersecurity and prevention and creating guidelines, right? Um, so if you really want a guideline, go to this link or a policy, right? Um, so if you want to know more about cybersecurity, there are free courses that you can get to. All right, so thank you everybody. Thanks for joining today. Um, please help us. Uh, we have a platform called spot.lk. We are trying to make it a we are trying to make it a human capital platform. Uh, I, I really like if you would go there, or I would really appreciate if you'd go there, um, create an account. Um, we want to make the spot platform the best human capital platform. Thanks everybody. Have a great evening.